Canadian soccer fans, this has been surreal. And surreal, defined in the dictionary as marked by the intense, irrational reality of a dream. But to relive it used to be tough. And that pain now seems like just fuel to the fire. Whoever said it's the journey, not the destination, man, they must have been a football fan. In the previous chapter, we explored just how bleak things got for Canada after the 2000 Gold Cup win. On January 1st, 2018, Canada's men's national team was ranked 95th in FIFA World Rankings. The next seven countries ahead of them, Belarus, Gabon, Cyprus, Armenia, and El Salvador, Libya, and Estonia, had a combined population of less than 80% of Canada's. On the surface, there was almost no reason to feel optimistic about the state of Canadian soccer affairs. But for national media members working the day-in, day-out grind of covering sports, noticeable changes had been taking place. There was a time where if you brought on like a Blue Jay or a Leaf and said, who's your favorite club team? They would look at you like you had a third eye growing out of your forehead. Around major tournaments were played, World Cups, you could see the reaction on CBC, what people got. Italy winning the 2006 World Cup, and you see thousands of people in the streets of Canada seeing it. It started to take off, and people started to see it more. And then a big shift for me was the next generation of people born. The teenagers, the 20-year-olds that suddenly were out there saying, wearing the kits, they were getting access more, internet world took off. And that was really where the IQ level of the fan the next generation went up. It wasn't just they read something that they heard he's a great player. They were able to create their own opinions on these players. And that, for me, was absolutely enormous. The question as to why younger Canadians had a greater inherent knowledge of soccer couldn't be solved with one straightforward answer. It was the culmination of a bunch of things, some intentional and some not. But all of them played a part in sending us to our final destination. This is Chapter 3 of our World Cup story. In 2005, Toronto became the first Canadian city to be awarded an MLS franchise. And in 2009 and 2010, Montreal and Vancouver would establish their own franchises in the league as well. You know, I think without those clubs coming into this country and showing that they could be professional environments with professional academies and the ability to train every day and attract better players, then obviously young Canadians got better because of that. But it also developed a culture across this country that was absolutely pivotal. We needed that, particularly from the men's game, that we got these MLS clubs into this country. We were screaming out for that professional environment, right? That's what was really needed. I think that was a massive part in the turnaround of what needed to happen in this country. Now there was a North Star for talented Canadian players rising through the ranks to look at. Toronto in particular, being a cultural melting pot in addition to its stature as a major North American market, was able to attract well-known players from abroad. What surprised many, though, was how many young Canadians knew of the overseas players that TFC was attracting. The dance floor has been packed for a while in North America, whether it's the NBA, whether it's baseball, when baseball was number one, and they're not now, but you had to fight college sports in the States specifically. You had to fight a lot of stuff. But it's been EA Sports in that video game. FIFA, the franchise, did everything. EA Sports. It's in the game. The EA Sports FIFA video game series skyrocketed in popularity worldwide during the 2000s, selling millions of copies in just its first week of release. FIFA became an integral part of student house culture. If you're playing FIFA all week with your buddies online and Liverpool plays Man U on the weekend, you're now half interested. And it goes with Champions League and Barcelona, Madrid and all that stuff. That video game changed everything here. Everything. The video game boom, coupled with more broadcasting rights being secured for soccer in Canada, and the rise of social media made the 2010 World Cup a sneaky important juncture for soccer interest in the country.
that World Cup, we did a, a show, a nightly show on the score called FIFA World Cup Tonight. It was James Charman, Christian Jack, Set Six Arrow, and myself. I was the Twitter guy. I was the social media guy. I would read the tweets in the show. And we would have these extended highlight packs. It was very much like BBC's match of the day. And Canadian soccer fans had never seen anything like that. To see a 10 minute highlight pack of a game that happened in the middle of your business work day, that changed the way people wanted to consume the game because now they had access to more and more of it. You look at the internet and the evolution of the game from 2010, because that was the first social media kind of World Cup. France 98 was probably the first satellite World Cup where every corner of the globe had access to more than just one national game or their own national game where you could consume and see everything. And in 2000, after Canada won the Gold Cup, the regional tournament, there really wasn't kind of a, you know, a moment or a platform to take it to the next level like that. It was just a bit too early. As helpful as leagues, video games, and informative social media-friendly shows on national TV were to soccer culture in Canada, when we're talking about the development of the men's national side, one very Canadian reason sticks out above all. You know, right now, over 70% of the team is either an immigrant or a child of an immigrant. Babatunde Omotoye is one of Canada's foremost experts at the intersection of immigration and sport. Omotoye has a large viral following thanks to his tireless efforts in helping refugees and other global citizens gain admittance and citizenship to Canada. As an avid soccer fan, Omotoye has been overjoyed to see the positive effect immigration has had on the national team. Canada has over 80 pathways of immigration coming to Canada. Perhaps it's important to note right now that the family class and particularly the Protected person class, right, is what helped us to bring refugees, right? And as of 1989, when that particular act was sort of passed, we had people coming in from Latin America, Eastern Europe, and even Africa, right? Alfonso Davis is one key player who benefited from this. The people of North America have always welcomed me. If given the opportunity, I know they'll welcome you. Alfonso Davies was born to Liberian parents in a Ghanaian refugee camp. His family had fled Liberia during the Second Civil War, and in 2005, Davies' family emigrated to Edmonton, where he grew up before being scouted by the Vancouver Whitecaps. Davies would make his MLS debut for the Whitecaps five months before his 17th birthday. After becoming a Canadian citizen in 2017, Davies chose to break the curse that had started with Owen Hargreaves and play for Canada over other enticing international options. What is your goal as a player? Um, my goal as a player to reach professional level and probably play with some of the pros. Uh, we got really lucky with Alfonso Davies, and I think that his is as much a community story as it is a soccer football story because he had a lot of support in Edmonton and the community there to get him in involved in soccer. Two years later, Davies would join Bayern Munich, and in his first season, still at the age of 19, was instrumental in their 2020 Champions League triumph. Alfonso Davies isn't just the greatest talent to ever emerge from Canada, he's one of the best players in the world right now. Full stop. And it turned out he was just a sign of things to come. Davies was the headliner of a series of transfers for Canadian players. Starting striker Jonathan David would join French side Lille, finishing as one of the French league's top scorers in 2021. Many others followed, and for the first time ever, there was an extensive list of Canadians excelling abroad. There are Canadian kids popping up in my feed every week that we didn't know existed. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's for Nottingham Forest? Oh, he's playing. We got a Canadian kid at Schalke? Really? Like, that kind of stuff is happening constantly. All Canada was missing was a leader on the touchlines. And it turned out he was already donning the red and white. The universe brings you things. It's strange. So if you're consistently good, more good things seem to happen for you. And that's what it seemed like with our team. They were consistently good. So take that with you. How good have you been today? Yesterday, at home and at work. And that's all I'm going to leave you with. So thank you very much and I'll see you next time. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, if only it was that easy. In just that 30-second snippet from a ceremony in 2015, you can immediately hear all the attributes that make John Herdman a special talisman. Inspiring, articulate, and charming, Herdman had been the Canadian women's national team coach since 2011 after a tenure with the New Zealand women's program. At the 2012 London Olympics, Canada secured a bronze medal, their highest finish ever, before winning another bronze at the 2016 Olympics in Brazil. Herdman had blown away Canadian soccer fans with his rousing coaching style as well as adaptable tactics. At the beginning of 2018, Herdman was named head coach of the Canadian men's national team. John Herdman is the coach of the men's national soccer team here in Canada, which still sounds a little bit odd. In addition, he was named as the men's national director for all groups 14 and up. In other words, he'd been given the keys to the car. One of the great things about John Herdman is that he will admit immediately if he thinks he's got something wrong and he's not afraid to change and adapt. Something I really appreciate about Herdman, and as a Manchester United fan, would always frustrate me with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, is Ollie would bring on a sub, and then the sub wouldn't touch the ball for 10 minutes. And it, I just would always think to myself, how can we not adapt our tactics in a way where our fresh legs are in the thick of it? And it always seems like when Herdman brings someone on, you can feel the fresh legs immediately impacting the game. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because that starts from the top, I think the players are the same. And you see that on the pitch and you see that quick IQ where they recognize this isn't working. We'll use this player, try this differently. This adaptation that used to be very, very slow for players and Canadian men's teams in particular. Herdman quickly made an impression. In October of 2019, Canada beat the U.S. 2-0 in a Nations League game at BMO Field. The win marked Canada's first win over the U.S. since 1985. It was a tone setter for their impending World Cup qualification campaign. To start that campaign, Canada cruised through the first round, winning all four games with a goal difference of plus 26. Next would be a home and away versus Haiti. Canada would win 4 0 on aggregate, taking them to the final round of World Cup qualification for the first time since 1998. Canada opened the final round with draws at home to Honduras and away to the United States. A 3 0 win over El Salvador served to boost confidence before a juggernaut matchup in Mexico at the Azteca, a stadium that Craig Forrest had never forgotten. Is the Azteca the most intimidating place you ever played? Yes. I mean, from a sound standpoint and, you know, the, the size of it and the history of it and all those types of things put together is very, very intimidating. Canada hadn't scored at the Azteca in 41 years. But on that night in Mexico City, for the first time in 20 years, Canada really gave its fans a reason to believe. Or as soon as he gets the ball, comes in, good chance to shot! Osorio, goal! As Canada equalized, you saw it coming. After a draw in Jamaica, Canada had a respectable seven points from its opening five matches setting up a massive game against Panama at BMO Field. It was the exact type of game Canada would have squandered in the past. And when Panama scored in just the fifth minute to silence the BMO faithful, you couldn't help but have an impending sense of doom, whether you were sitting at home, in a bar, or at the stadium itself. But this version of Canada didn't collapse. They kept coming, outshooting Panama 9-3 in the first half, including an 8-1 corner advantage. After an own goal even the contest going into halftime, it couldn't help but feel like new territory. In a vital matchup against a quality side, the Rouge were indisputably the predator, not the prey. With BMO back on its feet, 20 minutes into the second half, the table was now set for something remarkable to happen. Enter Alfonso Davies in the greatest moment of individual brilliance in the history of Canadian soccer. Keeps it himself! Goal! Alfonso Davies, are you kidding? 
The Davies Gold put Canada up 2-1, and they would bulldoze Panama from there on out, eventually winning 4-1. After the game, Drake visited the team's locker room, the ultimate sign that Canada's men's team had officially gone mainstream. I want my chips with a dip, that's all I know. I don't want my chips playing, I want my chips with a dip. It's, it's someone who travels a lot, and obviously I'm, I'm, I'll talk football with anyone. It's, uh, I'm that person that, you know, I hear an accent or hear someone say they're from some soccer-loving country, and it doesn't take me 10 seconds to start talking about their club or ask them who their favorite player is or their connection to the game somehow. And, um, you know, now when you say you're from Canada, people are asking me about Alfonso Davies. I don't have to say anything. People will hear my accent and want to talk about football with me. Canada would beat Costa Rica at home in its next game before looking down the barrel at a monstrously important three-game run, home to Mexico, at Honduras, and home to the United States. On November 15th, when Canada took the field against Mexico, it wasn't in Toronto, or Vancouver, or even Newfoundland. It was in Alfonso Davies' hometown of Edmonton, in negative 10 degrees not including wind chill. In fact, it was the coldest game the Mexican national team had ever played on record. Oh, Canada! Canada defeated El Tri 2-1 before dispatching both Honduras and the States to rocket to the top of the CONCACAF table. From there, they just needed three points and they would get it at home with a packed house against Jamaica, a 4-0 blowout that was never in doubt. They become a revelation, this Canada team. During post-match celebrations, Sportsnet reporter Arash Madani spotted a vulnerable-looking Craig Forrest. Craig, we knew this was going to happen. As an alumnus of this program, how do you describe it, all of this? Um, I've got no words, buddy. I, I, I honestly have no words. This group of guys behind me that have you know, grown the game slowly but surely and so many bad times so many down times and the national team is i, I just broke up my honors here i am I, I think it's the most amazing thing seeing john herman and these guys and uh the fans we've never seen this before history history it's history and uh just to be down here and be invited to be part of it is uh it's an honor it really is thanks Arash. Yeah, it was really interesting. I got really emotional. I, it's not really what I do, and I, I was just thrown away. I mean, I know Arash Madani really well, who did the interview, and personally know him as well. And he's he's a really smart, intelligent uh, guy who does great interviews as well. And he saw that there was a moment there, and he went, and emotion is what you want to see. And he spotted it that I was just standing there on the field, kind of looking around. And I think it was kind of like. What shocked me the most uh, that I didn't expect is that you're down on a field level where I haven't been for so long. I mean, in broadcasting, mm-hmm. you're up as a fan, you're sitting up, you're always watching from it up, and you get used to that. And then when you get on the field, you're like the dimensions, you know, the everything like that, the, the smell of the grass, sweat. It was just like it was almost being in your office again, and you just kind of set you back. And it was just such a brilliant Canadian moment to be part of that, uh, yeah, it was yeah, I was pretty overwhelmed by the whole thing, but to be honest. It was a brilliant Canadian moment. 36 years of torment evaporated into the Toronto sky amidst a qualification campaign that had resonated with the general public in an unprecedented way. Over 1.6 million viewers had watched Canada beat Jamaica on their TVs. Six months prior, the Canadian Soccer Association had been ecstatic that 700,000 tuned in to see Canada defeat Costa Rica over Friday night Canadian football action. The next day, my phone was flooded with questions from family and friends, all asking about the national team, their chances, and how we became a soccer nation seemingly overnight. And while I knew that it hadn't happened overnight, I knew there'd be a more appropriate moment to tell the whole story in the future. They are must-watch TV. And that it's something that we could only dream about watching Canadian teams of the past, men's Canadian teams of the past. The Canadian men's national team will never fail to qualify for a men's World Cup again. Never again. 
hosting in 2026. It's a 48 team World Cup. The infrastructure, the professionalization of the game, the opportunities for these men's players. The Canadian men's national team will never fail to qualify for a FIFA Men's World Cup ever again. The best way to ensure that Canada never failed to qualify again would be to build something sustainable within the country, which is what allured Christian Jack to becoming the vice president of the Canadian Premier League. The method of this league is to give Canadian players who previously wouldn't have had the opportunities to play in a professional environment. And the most important word of all of that, by the way, and there's a lot of them in that sentence, is play. That is the most important because if you're a 17 year old to a 23 year old Canadian player, you have to be playing. And it doesn't matter whether you're Alfonso Davis at Bayern Munich or Jonathan David at Lille or a Karifa Yao at Cavalry in the Canadian Premier League, you have to be playing. There's no substitute for playing significant minutes in the professional environment on the pitch with things that matter and challenging yourself and the ups and the downs. And that's why the Canadian Premier League exists to this day and is essential that it continues. Now, the incentivization of the young Canadian players is obviously there's rules in place that you have to have Canadian players on the pitch at all times, X amount of Canadian players more than than overseas players. You know, clubs are challenged to meet at least 2,000 minutes and they have to meet it, 2,000 minutes of under 21 Canadians to be played per season. And if you don't meet it, you won't make the playoffs, you are ineligible. And a lot of these clubs are developed differently. Many of them are blowing by that halfway through the season, giving young Canadian players opportunities to get on the pitch. And then also for young Canadian coaches as well. You know, there's so many young Canadian coaches now getting opportunities in our league. So it's fantastic that it exists. I'm proud to be involved in it. And um, this Canadian Premier League will produce Canadian international players. No question about it. We've already had a couple of them make the bench and make different squads and they'll continue to do that. And there will be a time where these players will go on to be stars and they'll look back at this time and be thankful for the, the opportunity at very young age to play so often. While the Canadian Premier League is poised to play a massive impact in securing the future health of the game for the men's national side, Canada's natural next step is to build infrastructure for the women's program as well. I feel like I am a very small fish in a big pond, but definitely have the potential to play in a pro league, which is why I'm going over to Europe. Pass by a spree, and that's LeBlanc. She's in a place to cross. Finds Emma Lefebvre, and she'll slip it in. That's a hat trick for Emma Lefebvre to make. Emma Lefebvre is one of the top scorers of all time at the University of Ottawa. A league for players such as her is vital for making sure we don't fail a women's program that carried the game in this country for the first part of the 21st century. It'd be just so nice to have a place to play in Canada. And we are just such a big country. And I've gone to Serbia to play. And it's like literally the like smaller than Ontario. And they have a women's professional league that they can field, you know? So it's definitely frustrating. And I think now is a better time than ever <laughs> to, yeah. to get started. If you look at our women's system moving forward, how say just for instance how Europe are taking it much seriously England particularly you got the, the Premier League teams now involved in women's uh, football they're not paying to play they're bringing them in they're, that's going to make them build and become stronger and stronger and better and better and we're seeing that now because Canada's women's team used to you know would hammer them six nothing you know 15 years ago maybe not even and you've seen the development go so quickly so that's going to be a, an issue for us and it's going to be a barrier from some for some of our development National teams don't have to exist in isolation from one another. Look no further than the rise of John Herdman, who of course started with our women's program. Enjoy John Herdman, because we're going to lose John Herdman after this tournament. But he is going to charm that media like you would not believe. Uh, He's going to be a star. Global media. Global. He's going to have him eaten out out of the palm of his hand. So let's enjoy Mr. Herdman while we can, too. This is going to be, this isn't just a tournament. This is a celebration of a lot of things, what John has done for our women's and men's program. John Herdman brought in an incredible amount of professionalism to the team and gave the players what they needed, you know, not only in terms of asking them and challenging them to be better and make mid-game tactics and improve their own quality, but also taking care of them in between matches. You know, we get lost in this world sometimes about outcomes and who's going to win matches and how it's going to be decided and tactics and X's and O's. But ultimately, there's a lot of time that goes between whistle, final whistle to the start of the next whistle. And what do you do in between those moments is crucial for any career, how the players take care of themselves and how governing bodies subsequently take care of those players. While we may lose an iconic Canadian soccer figure soon, 
Momentum and funding for the game in Canada is only going to grow from here. Just three months after securing 2022 qualification, Toronto and Vancouver were announced as two of the host cities for the 2026 World Cup. Thank you. Uh, Christian Jack from One Soccer in Canada will become the 19th country to ever host a FIFA Men's World Cup. How special is it for you to be able to bring this tournament to this country? Well, it's, it's of course, uh, uh, very special to bring the World Cup to uh, a great country like Canada. FIFA is expanding the World Cup to bring in more teams. The 32-team tournament will grow to 48 teams. From a development standpoint in CONCACAF, and I've had this conversation with the vice president of FIFA, Victor Montaliani, that expanding it brings in a bunch of hope and development for smaller countries in, inside of 41 countries in CONCACAF, like uh, Grenada, for instance. All of a sudden, they're lurking around the world for kids with you know, that background, because you know what, in the future, there might be as many as 10 teams of CONCACAF qualify for the World Cup with a few playoff spots. So Grenada is going, hey, maybe we can slip into that 10 spot. Before it was just a you know pipe dream. They had absolutely no chance right. of doing it. So from that standpoint, the development of the, and, and I think the development players all around CONCACAF, it's going to get better. Listen, wait for that World Cup in 2026. It is going to be an Instagram fest. Every athlete under the sun, it's going to be just, your feed is going to be full. And I can't wait. With the difficult group stage draw of Belgium, Croatia, and Morocco, Canada will have to earn any piece of success it garners in Qatar. And just like 1986, there will be millions of Canadians tuning into international soccer with real skin in the game for the very first time. Critics of soccer in our country have referenced the feeling of being preached to or shamed for disliking the game. When that kickoff whistle blows, let's make sure that we make everyone feel included. As we advance in the game over the 21st century, it's important that we never forget to give the trailblazing crew of 1986 their flowers, a heroic accomplishment that has never had anywhere near enough real estate in our sporting zeitgeist. To hang with that team for that long, come on. Yeah. It's one. Of, it's still to me. It's one of the great moments in Canadian soccer history. Their performance and under then, under a hot Mexican sun. And then there's the middle child generation that dealt with incredible amounts of backlash and ignorance, but persevered. Whether it be by earning the country glory at the 2000 Gold Cup, or helping educate the next generation of Canadian fans after their playing careers ended. And really, that's why I do it. Really, is for the the growth of the game, and we've seen incredible growth. Thanks, obviously, to the viewers as well. As the World Cup approaches, this is where we reach the end of our present day story. But with a young, determined, and supremely gifted core, I can almost guarantee that the next chapter of Canada's soccer journey will be the most fascinating one yet. I'll see you in Qatar. It was an amazing day, John, for a lot of people and an emotional day. And what was it like for you? It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I just sat there, let the guy spray us with champagne. He came one of the boys for about 45 minutes. I went back to my room at 1.30. I was up at 5.30 because I wanted to finish top of CONCACAF. I wanted the team to do everything they said they were, they were going to achieve. So by 6.30, we were all back to work.